Bear, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're here in town because of the Hunt Expo, right? Yes. Yeah, we have a booth for Born Primitive Outdoor, so we'll be here all weekend. That's awesome, man. I, I, we were talking about your military career before we came on here. You know, part of the thing about this podcast is we break it down into three subject matters. Survival, uh, which is survival slash preparedness, um, business, and then military. Like th those are the three genres that I focus on because I want people to kind of get that experience by listening to your experiences. And you cover down on all three of those. I mean, you, you're the guy. Um, before we get into Born Primitive, because you uh, started that business based on a lot of your worldly experiences um, and military experiences and academic experiences, I imagine. Um, let's start from the very beginning. Like, where, where did you grow up? And then what did you do post um, growing up? Uh, Midwest guy, youngest of three brothers, grew up in Indiana. So, you know, your normal kind of patriotic family. Uh, you know, we were all playing sports uh, through high school. I was lucky enough to get recruited to play football in college. So I, I played football at Yale University. I was a middle linebacker, graduated there. So you're the smart football player? I, I mean, I guess. I, imagine. I, I wouldn't say that. I think maybe I slipped <laughs> through the cracks. No, you know, we, we had an emphasis on academics growing up. So, we, you know, I did good in school. Um, and it got me, you know, a seat at the table at Yale. And then, you know, I made the most of that. I got good grades there and graduated and all that. But had a great time playing ball. Like, that's kind of – the plan was actually to enlist in the Navy out of high school. Um, you know, 9-11 happened when I was in eighth grade. And that was the – as soon as 9-11 happened, that was like – that this is happening, right? Because I was like, it's game on. And yeah. as, as a – you know, you know, young eighth grader, you know what I mean? He's, <laughs> a little early. You, you're starting to get the testosterone, you know yeah. what I mean? You know how it goes. So that was the plan, but the football opportunity was evolving and I kind of made a drug deal with my parents. Hey, if I can go play football, I, you know, I'll go do, I'll do four more years. And then they said, Hey, if you still have that crazy dream, then do it when you graduate. Got it. Um, so that's, yeah, went and did that for four years, graduated from Yale. And then I w went and worked for Red Bull, um, which was really cool, really cool brand. I learned a lot about brand marketing, which, you know, I've now used a lot of those kind of principles in Born Primitive. Uh, and then when I was 26, I realized um, it was now or never and decided to, to join the Navy. So um, did that whole thing. And um, Born Primitive was born a couple months before that me going officer candidate school. Um, just out of the garage, I came up with a pair of compression shorts um, for uh, this very niche need we were filling for Olympic weightlifters. Yeah. Um, I basically took an old football girdle from college cut out the quad pad and I had my neighbor who was a seamstress stitch it into the groin area of a pair of compression shorts because we were all doing Olympic lifting and for when you do snatch like some guys are drilling their pubic bone on the transition portion of the lift yeah to the point where like there were like professionals like like fracturing their pubic bones in competition so I made a prototype just so I could wear it when I was doing heavy snatch days, like in, in, the, in the weight room, right? Yeah. And then guys were like, hey, man, like you should market that, like make that. And I was like, no, this is ridiculous. Like, look at this thing. And then I, <laughs> I did research and I was like, I'm not the only idiot that has this problem, right? Um, so I learned about supply chain and, you know, and, and just self-taught um, on that front and then decided to take a swing. And I remember the first order, I'd order like 200 units, which to me was like wild. Yeah. So I ordered 200 units and then went off to officer candidate school. Um, and then, you know, I was married at the time. Mallory's our co-founder. Um, she kind of, she was full-time dental hygienist, so she had to kind of run things, but I was able to get my phone at officer candidate school because if you become the class leader, I was told by the previous class, the only way to get your phone is if you're the class leader. So on the first day, they say, who wants to be class leader? And you get like a 30-second speech to the class. I think there was like 60 in our company or whatever. <laughs> so I don't remember what I said, but they, I, fortunately they voted He's me. He's the guy. And I didn't want to actually lead the class. I just wanted to keep my head down and get done with this. because <laughs> And get your cell phone. Yeah, just get it. But I was like, if it gets my cell phone. So every night back at the barracks, you know, we should have been shining our boots and doing all that stuff. I'd be on the phone, you know, with one, bar, business one bar of service trying to like, yeah, do business calls and email my suppliers for the next order and all that. So... Uh, even from the very beginning, it was very scrappy. Um, you know, for the first six years, it was just Mallory and I out of the house, took over the whole house. There's boxes everywhere. We're running to the post office. And, you know what I mean? And um, that you know, grind. We, we bootstrapped the whole thing. You know, we didn't raise money. We still haven't raised money. Uh, oh, which, good for you. Yeah. Honestly, something I'm really proud of because a lot of the brands we compete with now have raised millions and millions. Oh, yeah. Hunt, some of them north of 100 million, right? And we just bootstrapped the whole thing and we're just scrappy as hell. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been able to kind of hang with the big dogs. Um, so, yeah. uh, that's the quick down and dirty, man. Yeah. Did eight years in the service. And then these last two years have been full-time born primitive, just trying to, trying to take this thing to the moon. So, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, um, when you did your military time, you became an officer and passed for officer, like good friends of mine, Andy Stumpf, who 
was um, an enlisted guy and kind of crossed over. Did you regret becoming an officer at some point? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I unfortunately, I think I got some bad guidance. Um, I equated it to like how I envision it being on the football field. Like I thought I would be kind of the middle linebacker of the defense, right? So in football, like, you know, if they run in motion and we got to change the coverage, a lot of times like the strong safety and the middle linebacker are helping like call, make that call in real time right before they snap it. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. The line stunts up front with the D line. Like you're, you're, you're there's a middle linebacker. You're very involved in, in a lot of that. Right. And I was mm -hmm. always, you know, I was the football captain in high school. Like I was always kind of in a leadership position. So to me, it was like, oh, I should continue being in that position because that's what na what's natural for me. But I didn't realize, you know, in, in our line of work, like that's the platoon chief is what I thought I would be doing. Like that's what you know what I mean? Yeah. Not the OIC, not the platoon commander. Yeah. Um, but it was still fun, man. Like it, it was still a really cool, th you know, opportunity. But yes, um, I quickly realized when I got into the job that I want to actually be doing the job. I don't want to be doing like, you know, I don't want to be making calls on a radio and like making nice PowerPoint slides. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Which is mostly yeah. the job of an officer yeah. nowadays. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I definitely regretted that, but still like it was an incredible opportunity and, you know, I made so many good friends and great teammates and I got, you know, you're just, you know this, you're around such type A guys that are just so unique and from so so many different walks of life yeah but super this, intelligent there's too, this yeah. common thread and you're just it's it's so hard to find that community so i i definitely miss that a lot but but it was a really cool experience yeah you you know you and your time with the seals were able to see a lot of different things especially you know even the the army procures a lot of its equipment from the navy i mean the navy is producing and um, developing a lot of the equipment that even the army uses and it's facilitated through crane and there's a whole acquisition process, but a lot of the stuff, even like the SOP mod kits that we were using back in the day were designed by the Navy and through the, the acquisition process, you had a lot of equipment, especially in clothing that you were able to see what worked and what didn't work. Did you have any epiphanies from that? Did you, were you like, Oh crap, this, there's a requirement here because this stuff sucks. Yes. So at the time, you know, when we, you get that first gear issue and you check into your, you know, the platoon or whatever, you think it's like Christmas. You go so down, sexy. You go down a supply <laughs> and you got like all these knives they're giving free. you. And like, you're like, this is free. You know, you put it in your cage and you're like, you're going through it all. Oh. Um, and it is cool, obviously. Um, but, but I quickly realized, you know, the, the gear we were getting issued, um, a lot of it I thought was subpar. And at mm. the time, you know, we were heavy into fitness apparel. So that's how, you know, Born Primitive in the early days, it was those shorts I talked about, but then we got into leggings and sports bras and on the men's side, like performance fitness apparel. So I was still in the fitness apparel lane, mm. but in the back of my mind, I was like, all right, eventually I'm gonna fix this because I know apparel and I am now the end user for, for this gear. And I think if I can combine the two, mm. and, you know, being an end user, kind of knowing what the need is and having a background and being able to design apparel, it planted that seed. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that, so we, so we got kind of our outdoor layering system, which I'm sure you got a similar mm -hmm. one. I think it was the Patagonia one. And I just thought there were a lot of discrepancies in the gear. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also didn't sit right with me. The more I learned about some of the brands we were getting gear from that they didn't actually support what we were doing, right. They, they were trying to keep an arm's distance length, but they yeah. were happy to take the SOCOM contracts. Right. Mm -hmm. So to me, once I learned more about that, I was like, wait, we got a bunch of like Patriots hitters wearing all these brands. And they don't actually like behind closed doors. Like they don't like us. Yeah, you know I mean, so that that was like another reason. Hey, the gear wasn't what I thought it should be, and and the, and the kind of some of the politics behind it. And uh, so that planted the seed. Now I, I didn't have the bandwidth to to execute on that until I got out. You know, mm. at, at the eight year mark. Um, but that was definitely in the early days. I was like, eventually, I'm going to fix this. Interesting. Um, and then you know, with the op camis, I felt like there was too much emphasis on like these heavy nylon, these heavy nylon fabrics that hold a ton of water and cotton blends. And I was like, why are we not using more high speed fabrics? So, cause to me, like mobility was the biggest thing. Yeah. Like if you're climbing a 50 foot caving ladder up a ship or you got to jump up wall into it, you know, or you're, you're, you know, you're running, sprinting with a belt fed through the woods and you get to jump over a log. Like we need shit that like, we need it to be made for athletes. Um, Interesting. Yeah, the fit wasn't for athletes, and the fabrics and the, the mobility was horrible. So I was shocked. I was like, "There's n we're running around in this shit." You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I, I was like, "All right, we're gonna redesign op camis. We're gonna get 
obviously all the guys feedback but we're going to do it in a way that when you put it on you're like oh damn i can move in this mm. right it's lightweight hey, if it gets wet or if we're sweating you know if we're, if we're in the ocean or we're sweating our balls off it's going to dry out quick mm. um you've probably worn the nylon cotton heavy op camis and it's like once it's wet it's like wet forever yeah you know what i mean like you're wet all day now yeah. um, and it like doubles in weight you know what mm. i mean so those were just kind of seeds that were planted to say i know we can fix this and make it better and um, you know, finally came to fruition. We just launched Born Primitive Tactical in October with our like, you know, our, our high speed op camis that are killing now and a bunch of dudes, you know, are wearing it and, and the feedback's been insane. So it only took me 10 years, but we finally, finally did no, it. That's man. what it takes, yeah. man, business wise. I, I, I remember when we were doing uh, task, we were working with task force. So it was dev grew the unit, us uh, at the SIF company and then um, Ranger Regiment and 22 SAS. And at the time, we were able to wear whatever we wanted. And I was wearing, uh, I think it was Aust it was either Australian or New Zealand, some some offshoot um, pajama that was really lightweight. It felt like pajamas. You could see the whole situation. Like it was literally <laughs> like silk bottoms. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I could see everything. <laughs> but it was, I remember, because at the time I was a sniper and I was doing a lot of building climbing. And a conventional ACU or e even at the time cry multicam uniform, it was Cordura. I mean, it was just like really thick material and it wouldn't allow us to climb like a climber would climb. Yeah. And yeah. you were just restricted by the clothes. And we were constantly blowing out crotches because of the lack of that mobility mm -hmm. and it would, it would stress at the seams. And then we adopted this also, I, th I think it's, uh, I'll look it up, I think it's Australian. It's really thin, really flexible. And it was like a game changer. And I was like, dude, this is the most comfortable stuff I've ever worn. And for very specific, deliberate operations, it was perfect. Likely not the greatest thing to wear long term in the field for extended periods of time, but for doing the hit, flying the helo, doing it and coming out, it was perfect. But we didn't have that ability to change those uniforms because, you know, R the R&D process at a, a minimum two years in special operations was very difficult to navigate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I felt the same thing. There were some, I remember there were some Air Force guys that were rolling with us and they had some Gucci shit that they got. And we were like, what is that? You know, Air Force guys, they get all the money, all the nice stuff. They so get we, everything. We were working like drug deal trades with these guys to try to get their pants. And then I remember <laughs> I got one of the, the PJs, like I swapped pants with them. And I was like, and that was like, the, I was like, all right, we need to make something more like this. Yeah. Um, because man, I, you can move in these things and then they dry quick, especially you get wet. You know what I mean? Like that's so critical. <laughs> so yeah. We were getting wet a lot. So yeah, I feel yeah. like, you know, the cool thing about a civilian business is you don't, you're not, you're not really stagnated and, and constrained by a limitation on how you develop. You develop at the pace of your speed. And if you're developing this up and coming stuff for a civilian market, the military is kind of always behind. But if you're a leap or bound ahead, they could quickly adopt that. You know, even in a two year cycle, it's like, man, that that stuff's very different. I've seen guys like Kyle Morgan wear your stuff and I'm like, oh, that that stuff, people are paying attention to it. And the the adopters, the early adopters who talk about it, it's not hard for that stuff to spread like wildfire. Like if it works, it works. And then people tell each other it works. I know this from businesses. Apparel as a business is one of the most difficult businesses in the world um, because it's capital intensive. You need a lot of inventory, the R&D cycles. It's, it's just a, a, a disaster. Like we have apparel that are mostly private labeled and partnered but uh, mostly dealing products and training. How were you able to, to manage this from a business perspective? And did your experiences in the Navy, maybe in logistics, or even at Yale facilitate this or just this day at a time? Just on the job training, man, and yeah. making a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, we just, again, we just winged it. We had no clue what we were mm -hmm. doing in the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, we definitely still aren't perfect, but we've we've perfected it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it is a bit of a nightmare with the SKUs, man. I mean, now we're doing mm -hmm. pants. So these 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 op cam, the assault pant we launched. It's like we have like I think seven colors now. We have a thirty inch length, a thirty three, you know, which is like our regular, and then a thirty six inseam length. Right? So yeah. you got short, regular, and long. Like you yeah, know, we would get issued, and then you got t waist twenty eight up to like a forty six, right? Mm -hmm. And now you got what seven colorways? So do the math on just the pants, right? Like of keeping those SKUs stocked. Yeah. And then you'll get a random order where a unit needs a bunch of OD greens and you didn't forecast for that. So now you're wiped out and you got to wait three, four months to get restocked. So we're still figuring that out. So, but you know, we have, you know, on the fitness side, I mean, we have thousands and thousands of SKUs and 
Um, so yeah, it's been a lot to manage and, and just kind of little, you know, over time you figure it out. You, you, we made some major mistakes over the years. Um, during COVID, the supply chain got, shit got crazy. So to try to guess on demand when demand was going through the roof, but also lead times like doubled, mm. like how do you forecast seven months out? Like if I, have to, if I place this order now and I'm going to receive it in seven months, mm. how do you guess? You know what I mean? When, when you're exponential, right? So you put this huge order in and just hope for the best. Yeah. Um, so and it's the, typically cash or yeah. a line of credit that's. Well, yeah, and off. then it then it gets really complicated, yeah, because you got to manage your cash flow, right? So if you have to wire, you know, millions of dollars, and you're waiting on product, you know what I mean? And then let's say it doesn't move, you know, so it is this giant calculation of of um, you know, it's a bit of cat and mouse game and a bit of intuition, mm. and then you can rely on data, of course, too, um, based on like sale velocity, but. A lot of times, like that, only takes you so far. Like you got to kind of have gut instinct. Like if we're ordering all the op cams, it's like, all right, what colors do we think are going to hit? And we kind of mm. debate it. And like, all right, let's slide our chips in on those three. We'll stock the other four, but like those are going to be the the lead sled dogs. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so it's tough, man. It's I, I was actually out at Shot Show a few weeks ago, and I, I ran into one of the guys that was early on in be, founding Beyond, and he he's now out of that business. And he we had had a few drinks, and he was like. I don't know how you do it, man. Like, thank God I'm out of that game. <laughs> I, was yeah. like, I remember that company I, beyond. Yeah, yeah. I, was like, I don't know any better. I was like, this is just what we did. And, you know, it all started with a, just a pair of compression shorts. So there was no vision at all. We were just going for it. Yeah. Mm. Hey, guys, this podcast is brought to you by the U.S. Concealed Carry Association. You know, we're big fans of survival when survival always depends on one question. How prepared are you? Just like we work to be prepared to survive any situation, the USCCA trains you to be prepared and feel confident as a gun hunter, especially if you ever need to use it in self-defense. I've been a member for over three years because not only do I get access to their online protector academy, where I can learn from experts on critical aspects of survival, such as how to shoot accurately under pressure and how to prepare for family and home defense planning, but I also get self-defense liability insurance in case I'm ever involved in a dangerous incident. There's a reason 800,000 American gun owners like myself trust them. So check them out at uscca.com forward slash FCS to claim your risk-free benefits right now, as well as a free gift when you sign up. That's uscca.com forward slash FCS. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because, you know, you could be one misstep away from completely destroying the business. You know, it's not like any other businesses where you could you could land on predictable measures when you look at supply chain and you invest all that capital, if something goes wrong along the way, direct to the consumer, it could be like a bad, this stitch isn't right. And then it all fails. Totally. You have to recycle the entire thing. And there's not a lot of uh, contingency plans can, that you could build into that. Yeah, that's huge risk. So if there's ever a new supplier, like you, that's a major danger because like our suppliers we've been working with for eight or nine years, if they mess something up, like they know, like, cause I'm giving them so much business, like they have to replace it. Right. Yeah. Cause we're not going to sell that to the customer. Mm. Right. And that's happened a few times. And obviously the customer doesn't see it. Cause if, you know, even if it's thousands of units, they'll say, Hey, ship us another batch. Like I'm not selling this. And they're mm. like, because the business is so strong, they know, all right, it's worth us to keep their business. Um, but I remember that during COVID man, we had brought in a new girl for help with inventory management and I was deployed. Mal was doing her best to run the business. We're in explosive growth cause of COVID. Right. And, and, and this was, this girl did not, this was not on purpose, but she was trying to use this new software and she just wasn't experienced like she should have been. And that's, on, that's our fault for not hiring the right person. And she was just doing her best. Um, but I'm on deployment running around. Mal's like doing a million things, trying to manage the business. So she would submit these purchase orders to Mal and Mal would see it and be like, yeah, sounds good. Like send it. And mm. I eventually got back from deployment. I looked at some of the purchase orders. And I remember like one time we, we like ordered like 30,000 units of like a maroon women's jogger, like in one color, like like 30,000 units. <laughs> and I looked at, I was like, how many did we sell in all of that last year? And it was like, you know, a fraction of that. I'm like, wait a second, what the hell? You know what I mean? <laughs> and and it, we got to the point where we were so over indexed on inventory that like I had to loan a bunch of money to the business to like, now the business was killing. So like, you know what I mean? We were, yeah. you know, technically profitable because you can't write off your goods until you sell it. Yeah. Um, but we were so over leveraged on a cash standpoint, like me and me and Mal and like the, my brothers, we had to like put like over a million dollars into back into the business just to like stay alive. Crazy. And that was the year we literally made, you know, it was our best year ever. Yeah. Right. So you're right. I mean, one little miss and thank God I caught it. You know what I mean? Because um, you know, then I pulled a few layers back and I was like, wait a second, like this is insanity. Like did 
what, did we add a, a zero? Like, to, to, this yeah. should have been, you know, uh, 3,000, not yeah. 30,000 or so. Th there are major pitfalls, and, um, you know, we've been able to mostly avoid those. But that's how, you know, sometimes the best way to learn is the hard way, like that. Yeah. Because now, now I know, okay, that's a major blind spot, and that can kill you. What's, what's, Born Primitive is one of the best names for a clothing company I've ever heard. I've, I've heard about your guys' stuff, and, and like before I even linked up with you and we started talking about doing a podcast, and was really impressed by all the things you guys do. You guys do marketing really well. You guys obviously have a good reputation in the clothing space already from people who are, who are users. What's Born Primitive's mission when it comes to all the things that you guys are touching? Because... You know, I like I touched some of your pants that you brought in and was like, man, this this is not just for the operator. This is for the overlander. This is for the tactical guy. This is for the moto, moto guy. And so do you have a mission statement that you specifically have a goal of achieving in your vision? Well, I think it, it all comes down to just active lifestyle. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I think it's for yeah. us, it's all rooted at its core in the gym. That's where it was born, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it, it, and honestly, selfishly, it just became for, at least for the men's side, I wanted to have clothes for everything I did in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was like, we started with fitness stuff and then it was mm -hmm. like, we got into like athleisure apparel and then this like, I'm wearing our, you know, our flannel, like our can't, we call it our campfire collection. It's jeans and denim jackets and flannels, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like every, and then we have an active professional line. So it's like, we got like stretchy dress pants and like nice stretchy button up shirts that like look good. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and breathe. So every little component of my life, I'd be like, oh, well, let's design a little thing for that. It's like, yeah. so, you know, I kind of mirrored my active lifestyle and then, you know, it, you know, fit and function was just massive. Like it always, it, like, I just thought there were so many brands that were missing the fit and the mobility component. So most of our stuff stretches and it's such a simple thing. It's like, <laughs> just make everything stretch and yes. you're fine. Why would you not like, do that? I, I'm never going to wear a dress shirt ever again that doesn't stretch. Yeah. You know what I mean? And same with my dress pants. Like when I sit down, I can't like blow out the, the ass team because yeah. I'm doing, you know, squats. I'm on a squat cycle or something. So I think from the product standpoint, it, it, that's really how these new spinoffs created, you know, for out, Born Primitive Outdoor, which we launched last year. That, you know, that's a, that extended field stay layering system that, you know, we got trained on, you know, and, and we got issued. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, I think we can make this better. And I think from my optics, some of the brands that were making that gear were too far removed from the shooter level wearing it. You know what I mean? Mm. Like even the big brands that you thought are very credible in those spaces. I was yeah. like, I, I think the guys designing this probably haven't worn kit in 10 years. You know yeah. what I mean? And I was yeah. like, so good attempt, but there's little nuances. If you're actually the guy wearing it, you're like, they missed this. Like they didn't think of this or they, mm. they didn't think that this zipper is going to flap and uh, free fall and slap you in the face. And like, you know what I mean? These little things where you're like, had they tested this with a guy actually doing it for a living, they wouldn't have done that. So I, I saw opportunity there. Um, and I think just from a brand positioning standpoint, you know, we've always positioned ourselves as a brand that like one, we're, we're never going to apologize for loving our country. You know, we're always going to support the flag. Um, I saw an opportunity um, when I looked at brands across all spectrums, I, I saw very few brands were relating to just a patriotic kid from the Midwest like me and, and, and the dudes that were doing the job and, you know what mm. I mean, our police and first responders and, you know what I mean? I just thought, man, they're, they're really missing it here. Mm. Um, there's a large, you know, cohort of our population that, you know, is all about that and loves our country. So that was one thing I never wanted to waver on. So from the very, very beginning, we've been unapologetically patriotic. And, you know, I think from the, the other part of the mentality of the brand is the way I was raised and it kind of, you know, influenced the brand personality was like the victim mentality that's being like pushed in our society like mm. we wanted to cut against the grain on that completely mm. and then just reject it and say hey you only get what you earn you know what i mean you got to go out and get it um so we, we've definitely always had a little bit of an edge um and that was on purpose and, mm. and i think it's much needed right now in our in our current especially in our current society and i think that's why we've been successful because I think guys like the products, girls like the products, but more importantly, they're like, Hey, I can relate to the ethos of that company. Yeah. Um, and we didn't, it wasn't just a punchline, you know, we actually, you know, over half of our employees, our former, you know, our veterans, former first responders and the spouses of those, you know, we, we donate a good amount of money to veteran charities and things like that. So we, and then, you know, I serve, so I, I, we try to back it with like, well, what are we actually doing about it? Yeah. It's not just some company slogan, you know what I mean? Like we're living it, you know? Um, so kind of went long on that, but, um, uh, yeah. It seems, well, it seems like the message of all the things that you're doing is based off of you. I mean, a lot of what you have experienced and what you do, and that's awesome because you need a messenger. You need a leader 
to kind of run the, run that entire thing. And like I look at things like Cool, you know, Made in the Mountains, and they're a great company. I mean, Kevin and the guys who started Cool are in our backyard. None of the shit fits me. I mean, it's just so tight and just it's I'm constrained. And yeah, it looks good and functions decent in garrison, but it's not like the stuff we need for doing the, the activities that we do. I mean, for like the pants that I saw with the the reinforcement on the back of the ass and the back of the legs, like people miss that all the time. Like I've blown my big ass. You're me and you're the same size. Yeah. Our big asses cannot wear conventional clothing because we will blow out seams, blow out. And, and then that's from being an active, larger person. And there's not a company that's making equipment for those type of people, which is crazy because you would think the guys who are putting out this equipment are actually going out and doing that. And most of these companies don't find out until the feedback and they're like, dude, like my cool button, every time I go out on all my cool pants, the button blows out the top. And it, I've looked it up online, it's like a, a big issue. But most of the issue is because I fluctuate 10 pounds depending on what I eat that day yep. and water weight. But again, like why would you not put elasticity yep. so you could address some of those issues? I, I'm interested your take on 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 uh, material because a lot of the material we used uh, in you know the global war on terror and military issued stuff is mil spec, and I almost feel like that's a direct line to 500 denier, like uh, 1,000 cordura. But you've you've got a lot of creative ways on how you look at material and textiles and integrate it into clothing. Like, what's your philosophy on that? And kind of what are the, some of the things that you guys are doing different that you could talk about that's different from everybody else? Well, I think that when we select the fabrics, um, you know, they're, they're, I, I, I know I'm beating a dead horse, but there has to be a mobility component to it. And that's mm. like the number one thing we look at. Like, like it, movement, yeah, physical exactly. movement yeah, of yes, your body. Like if, if I have to climb a ladder or I need to sprint or jump over something um, or whatever, like I need... I feel like guys in our in our line of work should be treated like athletes. Mm. Like you know what I mean? Like y you wouldn't give a a football player like a pair of football pants that don't stretch. They'd yeah. be like, "Oh, hey, wear these nylon pants out on the football field." You'd be like, "That makes no sense." Yeah, interesting. So we need to apply the same <laughs> principle because we're moving just as much as those guys are, right? Yeah. Um and so like to me it was such an obvious thing. Like why why isn't everyone doing this? Mm. Um are they talking to any any of the end users like, you know, and, and so um you know, the fabrics, you know, we we're we go nuts on on fabric selection like it's a little bit overwhelming in the beginning we kind of narrow it down but the cool thing is like we have a massive advantage because in virginia beach we have a lot of guys that are still able to test it and mm -hmm. even the guys that work for me you know that were in, in in the line of work like you know our guy bruno who runs um born proof tactical for us and he was a former 160th and former mm -hmm. sf guy and just an absolute uh, stud he did 41 years wow he would take the op pants and go do like an otb like mm. on the beach and he'd come back with this report you know what i mean and he would wear them to the gym and he would he was dropping you know even like the developing the knee pad insert we we had like we, we were like all right let's get like five different thicknesses and then mm -hmm. bruno would wear all the different thicknesses and drop to a knee on like a rock and like and then put the other one in and then drop it because we mm. want to all right how how minimal can we make this to still protect like we need to yeah um and even pockets like we they, they of course all needed to be able to drain out right so when you come out of the water in the beach like you're, you don't have the big pocket full of water which you know every little nuanced thing was thought through um and uh so so the fabrics had to kind of align with that mission so a lot of the fabrics like all right if we're going to be in the water and come out of the water it can't be dry for, it has to dry fast um we want it to be lightweight um and we but it needs to be durable enough right so there's a lot of super lightweight fabrics that we experimented with we're like all right yes these feel freaking awesome mm -hmm. like if you if you come down a wall or something like you're gonna they're gonna rip so like there, there's a there's a there's a balance, right? Mm. Uh, I don't need this heavy nylon stuff that like, you know, is going to be totally bomb proof because I'd sacrifice a, little, a lot of mobility, find that middle ground of material that's durable enough, but is way better in allowing the person to move in it. Yeah. And that's kind of how we narrow it down. And then, you know, we've got into like, we've learned that you can like silver treat the fabrics now. So like it's this crazy antimicrobial property. So they do this silver mist on everything, like little things like that. Yeah. Because like over time guys are like, Hey, I've wore this for two years. It's starting to stink. And we're like, oh, check. So we'd go back to the drawing board and, okay, we found this new technology. So it costs us a lot more, but it's like, hey, if I want this guy to be able to wear this under kit. Or if you're out on a hunt for eight days and it's your base layer, you know yeah. what I mean? Like 
you know how that goes. Like, you know, you, you're, you start stinking real bad, but yeah. if you got a nice merino wool that's been treated with this thing, it's like, yeah, that, that actually makes a massive difference. Yeah. So we just try to be really meticulous, man. Um, and we make sure like, hey, if we're putting our name on this thing, um, like that's our reputation. Um, and the way I see it is like, if, if a new customer buys our stuff for the first time, that might be, that is probably my only shot at convincing them that we make a good product. And if any of the products they get are subpar, like you're probably never getting them again. Yeah. And as competitive as the space is, like you just can't afford to miss that. Yeah. Um, particularly because we don't have a, we didn't raise a bunch of capital, right? So I'm not able to spend $30 million on Facebook ads. And it's like, oh, well that batch was bad. Like we'll just put another 10 million into Facebook and like we'll acquire a bunch, another 100,000 customers. You know what I mean? We, we, our margin of error is, isn't big enough to do that. So like in the development phase, we've got to nail it. So yeah, you, you, uh, I imagine right now, most of your sales are direct to consumer online. Yes. Do yes. you do any, do you do any retail? Yeah, we're, we're starting to dabble in that. So we're, we're in the Navy exchanges and then we, we have some oh, really? retail accounts. Um, but yeah, Navy exchange has been going really well. And we just brought on a director of retail sales. He's been in the game like 25 years. Um, so I'm turning him loose on going after the, the big box retail. And it's a huge step. He sees massive opportunity. Um, you know, he looked at our brand and he was like, man, like they need this because like the brands that are, are boring now, like they're going to love the fact that you guys have edge and you stand for what you believe in. Yeah. Um, so he thinks there's a high probability that, you know, we're going to get some really good traction there. So that's kind of the next phase of this that brings a whole new, um, onslaught of risk and cash flow considerations. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like you could get a $20 million purchase order from someone, but it's like, all right, now I got to wire millions to fund it. Mm -hmm. And if they're on net 90 terms or something, and then sometimes I'm hearing like, they don't even pay, like these retailers just won't pay. Mm -hmm. And they'll just like, you know, it's been six months and they're like, I will pay you when you pay you. Cause they know they kind of have the leverage. Oh yeah. So it's, we're, it's a whole nother game that we'll have to of course navigate. And, and he's been in the game. So I'm going to rely on him to kind of, illuminate the blind spots. Um, but I think it's, it's time we're 10 years in. I think we're ready. Yeah. That's yeah. a huge step, man. I, congratulations on that. I know big box retail is something that I didn't really understand until we started dabbling and then all the constraints it creates and, you know, back, back cash inventory, flow management, like all these things you're like, Oh, so getting a $10 million PO is a problem. Yeah. So it's a huge problem. It's a good problem to yeah, have. Good problem to have. But it's a big problem. But dangerous. Dangerous. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Look, how do you, what's your, outside the apparel, what's your marketing strategy for something like Born Primitive? Because, you know, they're, like you're at the hunting expo right now, and I could see this as a hunter pant, um, but you have to integrate with camo. You got to do all these things. And there's dilemmas in that market, just like if you went into Overland West and Overland Expo there's dilemmas in that market. How are you positioning the company and telling the story? Like what are the, what is the strategy there on something so comprehensive it seems? Well, I think in any, any kind of vertical you enter into, you have to be really credible, right? Like you can't just come into the space and like, okay, we're in hunting now. It's like, all right, you know, mm. are you, are you a part of this community? Same thing with tactical. Like yeah. that one was an easy one mm -hmm. um, because that was our roots. Um, you know, so for the outdoor one, you know, we, we partnered up with Aaron Snyder. Yeah. Um, and you know, obviously he has huge credibility in kind of that Western hunting. He's space. the man. Yeah. And, and basically I, you know, I went to him and I got linked up through a mutual friend and I said, Hey man, I introduced myself and I said, I know enough about layering systems to be dangerous. I also know how to design apparel and find the Gucci fabrics, but like you're the dude in the field now, 250 days out of the year. Mm -hmm. I need you to, you know, kind of provide that last 20% to, to fine tune these products. Mm. So like, we're going to work together on this, but ultimately like your name is going to be on this and mine. So like, and, and that's how it all started. So right. that's just one example of like, you know, we, we try to enter a space with credibility and, and we obviously leveraged Aaron's credibility in the beginning, mm -hmm. but now we're in it. Right. So we're going out on hunts and, you know, we're at the expos and, you know, we're, we're trying to be a part of it, not just trying to serve like Facebook ads to people on their newsfeed and hope like, yeah. Oh, we're a hunting brand now. Like it, and, and that's in the early days, we were a CrossFit brand um, and we were born in the CrossFit gym, but like we were credible because I was competing. Like I would go do like my heat and come back to the booth with chalk all over me, all sweaty. And I'd be trying to sell like sports bras, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it was like, oh, this makes sense. Like this yeah. dude's a part of our, our, you know, he's, it's endemic <laughs> to the community. So that, that credibility naturally happened where mm. I see a lot of other brands, they'll try to like pivot to a space mm. and they just throw money at it. Um, and they just think, all right, if we sign all the big athletes and we just crush their newsfeed on, on Facebook and you know what I mean? We sponsor all the big, yeah. like the title sponsorships, like we'll, we'll be accepted. And a lot of times it doesn't work like that mm. because in those 
kind of tight knit communities, you can sniff that out pretty easily. Mm. So I think re regardless of where you're going, you have to do it, um, you know, the right way in a way that like, they're like, Oh, right on. Like they are one of us. Like yeah. it, it makes sense. You know what I mean? And yeah. for us to go into outdoor, like it did make sense. Tactical it totally made sense. Um, and so that's kind of how it's evolved. How do you, how do you guys, um, do you project like your three, five, 10 year plan? What's the, what's the whole plan with a apparel company like born primitive? I mean, uh, some, some businesses are made to sell, right? People yeah. create these business plans and it's, it's to eventually get an acquisition. Yeah. What, what is you guys' plan? Because it seems like you enjoy what you do. Obviously, you wouldn't be in the grind if you didn't. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I had been really stubborn to private equity money throughout the entire kind of life of the company because I saw a lot of brands we competed with were getting raising you know millions, and you would see the brand change almost immediately. Yeah, and, yeah. and I was like, there's no way I'm going to let yeah. some dude in a suit in San Francisco and New York, like running my company. Yeah. Right. Like born primitive needs to be true to who we are. Like we're never going to change. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like we just, we will lose everything we have. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, so I was always kind of very vocal about that and, and maybe probably to a fault. Um, but I'm now to the point where like, all right, I realize there are good partners you can find that still align with your values mm -hmm. and can allow you to maintain the, the kind of the, authenticity that you have now you gotta be mm -hmm. careful who you get in bed with of course and that's Always. something to move that out yeah i also re realized honestly just on a personal level um that most of my net worth as a human was tied up in this giant thing i had been building for 10 years right and mm -hmm. it was like all right for for the sake of my family and, and kind of just i would like to take a few chips off the table right so this all isn't for nothing if something catastrophic happens um so we right now we're on a road map I'm, I'm, I'm calling it a two to three year window. We, we are optimizing a business, the business to um, take on a major investor. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's why we're getting into retail. Like that'll look huge. We're obviously diversifying the brand into outdoor and tactical. We're diversifying our supply chain. We're, I'm basically reverse engineering. Okay, what, what are they going to look for from like a risk standpoint? Like where, where's the risk when they to invest in born primitive? I'm trying to get ahead of all of those. Because mm. we were in the process um, and we had a very good opportunity um, and uh, the banks shut, you know, the Silicon Valley Bank. We were we were under an LOI, so we have 60 days to close the deal. They mm -hmm. get to do all their due diligence. Everything was going great. You know, we were everyone was high five, and we thought we'd close in March. This was now January. Silicon Valley Bank went down, and then like a few other banks went down. So then the the debt market went went to shit, right? And yeah. then everyone started getting skittish. So long story short, that deal fell through. So I went through an entire year process thinking we were going to close and, and, it, and it fell through last minute, mm. but I learned a ton. Now I know what they look for. And I was like, check, we're going to do this again. And next time we're going to be even more ready. You know what I yeah. mean? So that's and my, bigger and, and bigger. And we're going to be way more investable. Cause we're gonna be like, Hey, before we didn't have tactical, we didn't have outdoor. You know, we, we also have a shoe uh, performance. Uh, it's called the savage one, which is killing. Um, and uh, you know, we have a podcast now, like we, you know, so we have some intellectual property kind of stuff that's been going really well. So, the goal is when we go back to the table, particularly if retail's ripping and we're selling to the government now, you know, yeah. we're very compliant made in USA stuff. Now it's going to get real interesting, and I, I hope it's just an absolute war. People want to, you know, come to to work with us. Yeah, I, I think what people don't understand about business in scale, especially when you're leaping and bounding in scale, you're evolving to to mega companies. There is like it's not selling out by taking on capital and building and evolving because there are a lot of partnered opportunities with larger companies that allow your brand to have more brand equity, more social equity yeah. and influencing and, and getting your product out there. Like I, I tell people, if you go to Walmart or if you go to Bass Pro and you buy something off the shelf, most of the time, especially in big box retail, you're doing it because of the position it is in the store. You go, oh, this looks nice. Yeah. Right. And and you don't go, who's the owner of this place? Yeah. I wonder if he's got a good reputation. So if you have both positions because you're maintaining your integrity, you're you're building a brand through social equity, which is, takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears over the years, then you never want to lose that. So even if you take on capital, keep that validity and integrity you built in the market and then ramp it up and blow it out because you, you want both options. You want the person who's shopping and then puts on the pants and goes, these are the best pants I've ever worn. Who are these people? And then they're become more vested and interested versus just having one ancillary path where you're like, hey guys, our new drop drops this Friday. If, you, if you're paying attention, then potentially you could buy some. If you're not, sorry, I, like, I, we, don't, we can't touch you. And so I think there's a, a benefit of both because I think like, 
you know, I look at your company, I think about Origin. I know Pete, I know Jocko. It's like, man, there's something there. I don't know what it is, but it's like there's potential integration as everybody evolves together. And I yeah. think that's a, that's a cool thing is, you know, even in the military experience, you kind of recognize that where it's not just uh, your way in a unilateral vertical that's going to crush it. It's the partnerships. It's the investments. Like Aaron Snyder's perfect because he's the guy, he's the man. That's right. If you ask me who is the guy who's doing it for real, I mean, I feel like he should be sitting at, a, at his desk more. Um, I talk to Aaron all the time, and I'm, <laughs> but he's like, but he's backcountry hunting because all the time. It, that's why Kafaro bags are some of the best bags in the world because they ops test it constantly through his experiences. And that, that's, a, that's a good testament to what you guys are doing, man. I love it, man. Um, shoes. Yeah. So talk to me about these shoes. Yeah. So it's kind of same thing, man. I, you know, I, when I was active duty, I was like, I eventually want to do shoes. Because honestly, like as an apparel company, you can make the argument you're not truly legitimate until you have footwear. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're yeah. kind of JV. As yeah. soon as you're in footwear, like you're- All of them have it. Solomon, all these guys have yeah. all of them. Um, and I, I really liked the early Reebok Nanos and I liked the early Nike Metcons. I thought it was a great shoe. And obviously that's what I wore. And it's I'm, a cross trainer, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's kind of a CrossFit shoe. And unfortunately, over over the years, I felt as as the kind of customer that they were over engineering it. It was getting bulky, and it just wasn't the shoe it was back in the day. And I was like, I I know I can I could get back to like I know I could do this better, right? But I had no knowledge in in I you know in footwear. Like I didn't even know where to start. Uh, ironically, there was another officer um, at my team that his dad has been in the footwear game forever, and he was like, "Hey, dude, like, let me link you up with my dad," which was like, I literally passed him in like the hallway and at like you know at the at the team, and I was like, "Yeah, sure." So like we linked up on an email, and I realized they had done all this development for a bunch of big shoe brands, mm. and I kind of you know we did a kickoff call, and I quickly realized that these these guys were real players, and they help us bring the vision of the Savage One to life. Mm. Um, you know, it's just a train a cross training shoe, yeah, um, and I wanted it to be versatile enough that. You don't, you don't need to be changing shoes at the gym. To like, all right, I'm doing squats now. I got to put these shoes on. And then I'm doing a Metcon, so I got to switch, switch out to these shoes. And I'm running 400s, box jumps, whatever. I'm like, all right, put one pair of shoes on, and you're freaking good. Mm. Um, so that's kind of how we designed it. Um, and, uh, yeah, very long process. We went through, like, five or six prototypes. It was a little bit overwhelming because um, you, you don't even know where to start, right? Um, but once again, I was like, I told the team, we have one shot at this. If the Savage One doesn't rip, there will be no Savage Two. Yep. Right? Like it's just not gonna happen. Yep. So like I don't care if we have to wait another year. Like there's no timeline on this. There's no gun to the head. Like we have to launch by July. We will do as many prototypes and samples as we need to until we're like, hell yeah, we'll put our logo on that. Like this is gonna kill. Mm. And that's what we did. So that's why it took over two years. Mm. And we finally launched it last June. Um, we sold out in a day. Um, and now that's a whole nother problem because shoe lead times are like five to six months mm -hmm. and minimum order quantities are like, you know, 10,000 units. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a whole new problem set that you now have to learn about because it's, it's a different game. Mm -hmm. So how do you forecast supply and demand when you have to wait six months and your minimums are pretty big? You know what I mean? So that first order, people first like, order was a little risky. Cause I was like, yeah. what if the shoe sucks? And like, or what if there's a major quality control issue? You know what I mean? Like you're not getting that back, but that's, you know, why we did, we were, you know, very methodical in, in the design because I was like, we can't afford that to happen. You yeah. Know? And if you got 10 million bucks in the bank from the private equity firm that cuts you a check, you know, you have a little bit of a, of, of a, you know, a cushion. Right. But when you're using cash to, to fund the next purchase order all the time, like that, you really don't have that kind of safety net. So yeah, it's just gotta be, you, you know, just like anything, man, you plan it out and then you gotta, you gotta shoot your shot. So that's what we did. Your business gives me anxiety. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. It's, it's rough, man. We did it and it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it's it's cool because like, you know, I see an opportunity like in, in some of the designs, again, getting back to the kind of the patriotic values, like we're going to launch like our Don't Tread on Me shoe this year. Sweet. Um, and uh, we're launching the Betsy Ross Savage One um, next next year. Um, and we're doing a D-Day, 80th anniversary D-Day shoe. So it's like got a Band of Brothers vibe. I'm and, jumping into D-Day with Andy, Evan. Well, well where I, are those I, shoes? I think I'll be there. Um, so it's... Are you going to jump in with us? I mean, shit, if I can. Um <sighs> But uh, so, and so, I, so the Best Defense Foundation is a charity that takes the World War II veterans back to their yeah, uh, battles. Yeah, that's right. Donnie, yep. Donnie Edwards found he's a good friend that's of mine. That's right, yeah. So we're, we're doing this shoe in collaboration with them. We're going to donate a bunch of money from the sales to their organization. Um, but it's badass. It says 6'6", 1944 on the back, 0630, Operation Overlord. It's OD green. You know, it's greens. And um, it just looks badass. Um, and uh, it's going to, we're going to sell 500 limited edition ones. It's going to come in a big ammo can. Yeah. And then the wood crate, you know, that you got to yeah. break out with a multi tool to break it open. And then we're getting sand from Omaha Beach. So the prime minister gave us permission to bring sand back 
So every person will get a vial of sand and then a commemorative like challenge coin for, for what? just that shoe. It comes out um, June 6th? You will, that's when we're going to pre-order in June. Yeah. And unfortunately, we can't, it won't come in until August. So yeah. we just missed the window barely, yeah. um, but it is what it is. Um, and then you're going to get a baseball card with like the, the different veterans that'll be on the trip. So you can see like, oh, this guy like jumped into D-Day and it's so cool because the, the donations to that organization directly fund these guys to go back. So like some of these guys, because I went to the Pearl Harbor one um, and it was epic. Jack Carr was there too. Jack, yeah, yeah that's, that's where right. I met Jack. Became oh, good yeah. friends with Jack. Um, but um, you know, some of these guys, you know, did you know they were eighteen years old? You know, when they stormed, you know, like yeah. Omaha and Baby you know, Beach, and they haven't been back since. And so they take these guys back, and they have like historians next to them and say, "Hey, this is where your your unit like flanked." Up, to, you know what I mean, and they, and they and they they have the maps and stuff, and then they, and then they, it comes back to them, and then they go to the wow. cemetery. Some of these guys you know, never saw their buddies buried. So they're going to their buddy's grave for the first time ever. And they're, they're a hundred years old. It's yeah. freaking wild. Oh um, man, you'll so be there, right? I, I'm, I'm hoping so. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm working with Donnie. Um, so we, we, anyway, the, the shoe is meant to kind of commemorate the 80th and raise a ton of money for charity. Um, and it's just a badass shoe. Like even as a standalone without yeah. the D day thing, it's, it's a cool colorway. So it gives us the opportunity to kind of do cool shit like that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's hard to kind of, portray that through like you know a pair of shorts or you know what i mean but like with the shoe you can you can do a little bit more detailed stuff with it so we're really excited my you know my mind never shuts off with ideas like that so who the hell knows what'll be next and maybe you know gettysburg edition shoe i don't know um <laughs> but we try to leverage it to you know to for a good cause when we can um because that's get, gets people even more fired up too so yeah i love it man those yeah. you're right when it comes to patriotic positions there's coffee companies there's gun companies there's all these companies there's certainly t-shirt companies, yeah, but there isn't an apparel company that's positioning that way with more conservative values and just being the, the company that you get aligned with. Because, I mean, I, I think about REI. I, I, I really like REI. I shop there a lot. But when they pull like camel black, camel uh, back, the bladders are there. I saw the bladders there. I actually bought one recently from there. Um, but when they pull, they're actually stocked because it doesn't align or it's affiliated with guns or, or something like that. That's disturbing to me, man. It's crazy, man. Yeah. And yeah. It's to, to see kind of the shift, um, in, in kind of corporate, the corporate culture and like what's getting pushed jammed down all of our throats is just so nuts right now. Yeah. Um, to the point where like a lot of these things, you don't know what's satire and what's real anymore. You know yeah. I mean? It's, it's just so out of control it's and a tough landscape. And I see incredible opportunity there because, um, I think there's a lot of Americans that don't feel like they're, um, their values are being represented in mainstream media and our politicians and stuff. So like, it's like, Hey, there are actually brands who will have the balls to, to stand for these things. And mm -hmm. then we're not, we don't have to like whisper it behind closed doors. Like, Hey guys, let's just go out and say it. We don't need to apologize for like being all about the American flag. We don't need to apologize for being proud of our country and what it stands for. And, you know, like embracing freedom and just recognizing the, the sacrifices that have been made to give us the life we all have right now. Mm -hmm. So can we all like stop, complaining for once and just be grateful and you know what i mean and mm -hmm. especially you know these old guys man and you talk to them that you know, they're 100 years old and it's it's just, it's so different and then what, these guys were you know forging birth certificates to get into the war yeah you know what I to mean? get in and, and, and you know now people are faking some other things too <laughs> like, i wouldn't even i wouldn't even go there but you know what i mean right it's like what, what are we doing here <laughs> so crazy man what a time to be alive it man. is yeah yeah <laughs> Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast, man. Where can people find uh, the things that you guys are doing and and learn more about the brand? You guys have YouTube and Instagram. Yeah, and we got all that. So the, our main site is bornprimitive.com. Um, everything we talked about can be found on that site. But if you want more of an outdoor or tactical site experience, the outdoor stuff is on bornprimitiveoutdoor.com and mm -hmm. the tactical is bornprimitivetactical.com. You can find it all there. Same thing with Instagram. You know, it's bornprimitive, mm -hmm. born outdoor, tactical, et cetera. Um, yeah, so check us out. You know, we're a veteran-owned company. We're doing this about 10 years, you know, scrappy brand. We've always been the underdog. Um, you know, we do you know, leverage, you know, what we do to give back. So if that's important to you, you know, we're coming up on uh, over $2 million donated to date as a company to veteran charities. So, you know, we live it. It's not a punchline. It, it's, it means a lot to us. And um, hopefully, you know, if, if that fires people up and they hope, you know, like, like the gear, you know, that's, that's, I think an implied task, but you got to make a good product. You can't just be brand. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've done a, a decent job doing both. So. Awesome. That's where you can find us, man. Thanks, Baron. Yeah. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, bornprimitive.com, guys. And we're going to do a bonus segment after this on the app about specifically preparedness, especially textiles and 
like what equipment you need and also Bear's personal ideas and philosophy on being prepared and like what he does in his everyday habits. You find that on the Phil Craft Survival app. I'll link all the stuff we talked about down below, including uh, some of the charity work. We'll put that in the description as well. Uh, hope you guys are paying attention. Appreciate you guys. Till next time. Peace out.